you guys were here last week. So if you're here last week, then you know that we ended our In It For One series that we had been in for 18 months, okay? And that was a long series, and, and, and it was really awesome, and, and Dana gave a great message, didn't he? For those of you guys who are here, and I, I'd encourage you, if you missed that, go back. You can listen to it. You can even watch it uh, on our website, and uh, it will bless you. And this morning, I am excited to be starting a new series uh, with all of you guys, and this series we are calling The Road to Bethlehem. A and over the course of the next eight weeks, we are, uh, that's going to really culminate in our Christmas celebration, we are going to be looking at some of the milestones of Scripture, some of the main events that have taken place from the beginning of Scripture until the birth of Christ. And, and, and through these, we're going to be seeing how, how God has been speaking to and at work getting after these longings that we have in the depths of our hearts as human beings. And how really ultimately all the longings that we have in our heart are fulfilled in Jesus. And, and so we're going to be working our way here over the course of the next eight weeks. We're going we're gonna to celebrate big time when we get to Christmas. So I already want you to plan on being here. Okay, so like put it in your calendar like today and, and just think about who you're going to invite. On, we're going to do it on the 22nd. Think about who you're going to bring. It's going to be awesome. And, uh, and we're just going to have a huge party. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. I, some might say it's been said that this will be the biggest event in the history of The Edge. Uh, that's saying a lot. So that's all I can say about it right now. Um, we've set, uh, you know, if you've been around, we've set off fire alarms and broken all kinds of stuff. So I don't know where to go from there. Uh, but I'm sure it'll be somewhere. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to pray, and, and then I want to get at this uh, first message um, that we have in this series today. So let's just pray together. Father, I just thank you this morning in Jesus' name. God, that we get to come and that we get to gather, that we get to meet with you. Father, I thank you that we get to worship you, and God, you made us to worship you. Father, I thank you that, that for every single person who's here in this room this morning, Lord God, that you knew before we were that we'd be seated right here, right now. And God, I thank you that you have a word that you want to speak, God, to every single heart. I thank you that your word is true. God, I thank you that your word always accomplishes its work. And God, I pray that you would just do a work in us this morning. Father, would you just open up our ears to hear from you? God, would you just open up our hearts to receive from you this morning? And God, may we just grab hold of every single thing you might have for us. Lord, we just commit this time to you now, in Jesus' name, amen. Question for you guys as we get started. How many of you guys have like ever gone to see a movie at the theater and you showed up at least 10 or 15 minutes after the movie started? Has anybody ever done that? Yeah, that's like the worst experience in the world, right? Uh, unless it's a romantic comedy, right, because you already know how that movie's gonna go, right, the whole time, right? But, but if it's a good movie, all right, like, like if it's a good movie that you show up to and you show up 10 or 15 minutes late, it's like really frustrating, right? Because what happens then is, is you miss the whole beginning and you get there and you sit down and, and you just sort of spend what seems like the rest of the movie trying to figure out and make sense of what's going on. I, I remember talking to somebody one time who told me that they, they got to the movie Inception like 20 minutes late. They're like, I sat there like 22 hours, or like two hours, and I was like, I have no idea what this is, right? And they're like, I had to go back and watch the movie because I missed it, right? Like when we miss the beginning of something, right? We, it, it's oftentimes that we have to spend so much time trying to figure out and make sense of what's going on. I think that when it comes to our lives, that the same is true for us. That when we miss the beginning and when we fail to understand our origin, we just spend our whole lives trying to figure out who we are and what it's all about. The beginning, see, matters. What ends up happening then, right, that when we miss this beginning is that, that we end up looking in all kinds of places and to all kinds of people and spending all kinds of money in an effort to find some answers for us, don't we? And, and so that we look to our parents or family or our friends, even our Facebook friends, right? We, we look to like some girl or some guy or some relationship that we're in, to a teacher or a coach or a boss, to teammates, bandmates, classmates, right, whatever, a husband, a wife, to our kids, 
We look to our jobs, to our education, our hobbies, our talents, abilities, our successes and accomplishments, our, our, our possessions and our stuff, and we just go to all kinds of places, right? We, we, want to, we go to the shrink and the counselor and the therapist, to the doctor, to the gym, the bar, the club, right? We go to the internet, we go to the buffet, we even go to the Psychic Friends Network, right? We, we go like wherever we have to go, all hoping that someone or something is somehow going to answer for us this all-important question, who am I? Who am I? Am I significant? Am I valuable? What is my purpose? And what we find in our searching is that none of these things ever really get us there. Because in order to get there, we need to start at the beginning. And so this morning, what I want to do is start us at the beginning. We're going to start in the first book, in the first sentence of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1. That word Genesis actually means beginning. So, so we're going to look at the beginning, our beginning, and we're going to see what God says about that. The beginning matters because where we come from helps us to understand and make sense of who we are. It helps to shape us. So open your Bible to Genesis chapter 1 if you have it. If not, you can follow on the screen behind me. And the very first verse of the very first book of the Bible starts with this one loaded, powerful verse. And it says this. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How many of you have heard that before? Yeah. I I think sometimes what happens when you hear something over and over, like this verse starts to sound like the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, you just kind of go through it, and we lose its power. We lose what it's really saying here. But God doesn't waste any words when he starts at the beginning. And what God says to us right away at the very beginning is that there was a beginning of life, and he was there. And, And God says that, like, look, in the beginning, there's me. This is how God starts his book. This is how God starts the beginning. The Bible assumes that God exists. It just says, in the beginning, God. And God pretty much is just saying to us, like, look, prove me wrong. Right? That, pr- prove, prove that I'm not God. The burden of proof is all on you because I'm God. And if you disagree, then take a shot. Right? Th- this is why Psalm 14, verse 1 says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The Bible assumes God and puts the burden of proof on everyone else to disprove him and his existence. And what we see here from the very beginning is that this God doesn't begin with an explanation of who he is. He starts with what he does. And what does God do? He creates. Right? He created. That's what it says. In the beginning, God created. Now, now this is a big deal, too. Okay, this is a really big deal because actually the, the word that's used here for create in the book of Genesis is, is two Hebrew words. Okay, the first word that's used is this word bara. Okay, and, and this word literally means to make from nothing. This is a word, this is a picture of God creating something out of nothing that had been before. This is the word that's used when it says he created the heavens and the earth. There was nothing and he created that. Okay. That's the first word that's used. After this, then, from this moment on, this very first verse, from verses 3 to verses 25, all throughout that that five days following, there is this other word that is used in Scripture to talk about creation, and it is this word, asa. And, and, And this word doesn't mean to create from nothing. This word means to prepare for use. And so when we read in the Genesis account, and most of us have read this before, and you can look at that, that we see for like 22 verses, it says, it talks all about how God is creating. God creates the sun and the moon and the stars, and he he puts them in their place, and he creates the wildlife and the vegetation and the plants and the animals. He sets the thermostat, right? So like the temperature is just right, and he puts the oxygen just where it's supposed to be so that we can live here. God is preparing this place. So when God creates the heavens and the earth, he barahs it right? He forms it from nothing. But once he made the earth, then God assaults the earth. He prepares the world for use. It's like building a house, right? Like first you got to have land and then you have to like put up this structure of this house. 
There was nothing there, and then something has to be put in its place, right? This is, this is you barat, you frame it out, and you, you make a place where, where something can happen, but, but then you don't just move in, right? It's not like, oh, there's a nice house with a frame, like, let's just move in. No, like, then you get in there, and then you start doing all the work, and you put in the appliances, and, and, and you put in the beds, and you put in all the furniture, and you prepare that house for its use. You assault the house, right? This is really, really important for us here. Because what God is telling us from the very beginning is that all of his work up till this point in time has been in preparation for his next creation. That, that all of what God has been doing in creating the world and, and, and putting all the things in his place ha- has been this work for his next and last and final and greatest creation, the pinnacle of his creation, us. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says this. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness. This is what God says. This is God talking to God, okay? We, we have... What we have here and what we see in this is, is the God of the Bible, the triune God, one God, three persons, God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit. We call this the Trinity, all of them coming together to create mankind. The, the whole Trinity, the fullness of God is intimately involved in the making of human life. Let us make man, you and me, God says. And this is our beginning. We said we wanted to start at the beginning. This is our beginning right here, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And remember, this is a big deal because remember that where we come from shapes us, right? Where we come from tells us about who we are. It helps us understand our life. So if this isn't true right here, if God didn't make us, if life is really just the result of some great cosmic accident and some coincidental big bang, then, then, then I can tell you that the answer to this question in your heart regarding your worth and your purpose is simply this. You have none. That's it. And, and there, there really isn't any point to anything. You, you and me and everyone else, we're all just here by chance then. And we're all just one big accident, so now we can all just go home and do whatever we want to do, right? And just go on and live our worthless, purposeless lives. Who's encouraged? Right? Let's do that. Yay! But God says here, and we can't miss this at the beginning, this is why this statement is so important, is it says that, that God made you. That's a really big deal. You didn't evolve from nothing, okay? You didn't come from nothing. It's not that the impersonal made the personal. It's not that the unintelligent made the intelligent, right? It's that God made you. You're not here by random chance. You're here by God's design. Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed. And were created. John 1 3 says that through him, talking about the Lord, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. God did this. God handmade you. The picture that we see in Genesis chapter 2 is God literally putting his hands into the dirt of the ground and forming and creating you and then breathing his life into you, making you alive. This shows us our position in God. We come from the dust of the earth. That's a lowly position, but we are filled with the breath of God who gives us honor. So we are both great and humble as God created us to be. Everything else God created, he spoke into existence at this point. But when it comes to you and me, God makes us with his hands. This is what we see in Psalm 139, 13, when it says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. So few things are handmade anymore, right? You and me, though, we're made by the hands of God. God has worked on your life and he's created you to be the person that you are with certain skills and talents and abilities and capacities and God put you together and handmade you beginning in your mother's womb and God did so because he has such a great love and affection for you because he wanted you. You have value and significance and you have purpose 
Because you were made by God. You didn't just come off some conveyor belt and just with a stamp on you like everybody else, you know? We are peculiar people. Some of us more peculiar than others. Tony Woodall. Look at verse 27, it says this, it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So not only were you created by God, not only did God hand make you, but unlike the rest of creation, you and I were created in his image. How, how much does God think about you? How significant are you? In one sense, God prepared creation for you. And then he made you in his image. You are the image of God. What does that mean? Well, some people think that it means that we have a mind and we can think and we can reason. And that's true, right? That, that, that separates us. That, that, that puts us in the image of God. But that's not everything. Because, because even people who aren't born with that capacity and that faculty, right? Even people who are in comas and unable to really th process and reason and do some of those things in that moment, they still have dignity, value, worth, and purpose, according to God. O other people think it's because we have language that we can speak and communicate and read and write. And, and, and that's true, but what happens if you're illiterate? What happens if you're mute? What happens if you can't speak? You can't communicate. You still have dignity, value, and worth according to God. Some people think that unlike the animals, we have a soul and a spirit, right? That we're not just physical beings, that, that we, we, we have this spirit that lives on forever, and that makes us in the image of God, and that's true, right? But that's not all of it either, and, and some people would say that it's because that God loves, then we can love, and because God forgives, that we can forgive, and, and because God is gracious, we can be gracious, and all that stuff, and that's what it means to be an made in the image of God, and that's all true, but I believe that even more than that, the image of God is not simply something that we bear, it's who we are. The image of God is something we are. And guys, this is really important for us to know that, that, that because what it says to us is that every single human being on the earth has been made by God and has dignity, value, and worth for no other reason than for the fact that God made them. This is radically different than the world teaches us about who we are and our value, right? The, the world that we live in in our culture is one where our performance defines our value, doesn't it? If you're beautiful or you're rich or you're smart or athletic or talented or skilled, then you have a higher value than other people. The world tells you that what you do determines who you are and determines your worth. I, I, I had read, this was a while ago, I was looking through some of my old notes and, and I was looking at this old article that I read about this supermodel who had grown a little bit older and retired from the organization and the industry and they had interviewed her and, and she was sharing in this how difficult this next stage of life for her was. And she was quoted as saying this, It's hard for me to know what to do now because before I knew my place, I knew I was valuable because I was beautiful. In other words, all my value was directly tied to this thing that I did. The, the world tells us that our value is found in what we do. That you're valuable because you're beautiful. And that's not what God says. God says you're beautiful because you're valuable. God says you're beautiful because you're mine. You're beautiful because I created you in my image. You're beautiful because I breathed my life into you. And I handmade you. Every person has dignity and value and worth and significance. The born and unborn, the healthy and the sick, the rich and the poor, the old and the young, the brilliant and the simple. Why? Simply because they bear the image of God. Amen. That's why we who are Christians should be able to love our enemies. That's why we should still love those people who do evil to us and hate us because they still bear God's image. In verse 27, then it says, right, it says he created them, male and female, he created them. This is the first time that we see gender show up in the Bible. This is true, still true, right? Today, men and women are different. Thank you, right? Did you guys know that? If you didn't, you live in a cave or something. You find that out really quickly when you get married, right? How, how many of you guys have sons and daughters? Yeah, right? They're different, right? They just are. 
They're, they're, they're just different. I have two daughters and a son, right? My, my daughter Olivia wants to dress up like a princess and be beautiful. My son Mason wants to be a ninja and wreak havoc, right? <laughs> they're just different. That, that's, one's not good and one's not bad. They're, they're just different. That's how God made them, and that's so good because what this means then for you guys in the room, that you don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to prove yourself as a man because you can fix some things around the house. Right? Because you're really good at sports, because you can drink enough beer, right? Or pick up enough chicks, whatever it is. You don't have to spend yourself trying to prove your value and worth to a woman or someone else because you're an image bearer of God. For you ladies, this, this means that you don't have to prove yourself by what you look like. You don't have to prove yourself by what you wear and the right makeup and the right hair and the right shoes and the right belt and whatever that is, right? You don't have to prove yourself to some, having some man or doing that because you're an image bearer of God. You were made by the hands of God. We could have saved the feminist movement a whole lot of energy, time, and effort with just this verse. Right? You don't have anything to prove. You're an image bearer of God. We are equal by virtue of creation, by God, and by nothing else. So God made us in his image and his likeness, and he made every single person with dignity, value, worth, and significance. And we are esteemed of God, not because of our performance, not because of our gender or what we do, but simply because he has made us. The creator always determines the worth of the creation. It tells us in Psalm 8, verses 4 and 5, they're asking this question, it says, well, what is mankind that you are even mindful of him, God? Human beings that you care for him. Listen to, what, listen to the response. You have made them a little lower than angels, and you have crowned them with glory and honor. You have crowned them with glory and honor. You are crowned with glory and honor. That's kind of a good thing. This is a big deal that God did here. When we read Genesis, there, there's always God, and then there's like these plants and animals, right? And then there's mankind, and where are we? We're in the middle, Right? We're in the middle. We're not God and we're not animals. That's a good thing. It's important for us to know our place from the beginning, from how God created us to be, because when we don't, we either think that we're God and we think so much of ourselves and we walk around proud, arrogant, believing that we have the answer and we can fix and do and save ourselves and all those things, or the flip side of that is that we just think that we're just animals and we just have to act on every impulse. And so we just have to do drugs and have sex and spend money and destroy lives and relationships because we're just animals and that's just what we do. But we're not God and we're not animals. We're people made in the image of God. And because of that, you have an intrinsic respect that is due you and an intrinsic value that you ought to embrace. God has crowned you with great dignity and he has placed you under himself and over the creation. Go back to verse 26. It says, let us make man in our image and likeness. And then God says, and let them rule. Here's our position. Over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock, over all the earth and all the creatures that move along the ground. So God gives us value and significance as his image bearer. And then he also gives us position and authority over his creation. For, for you crazy dog lovers, this doesn't mean that you can't love your dog, okay? This just means you're higher than him, right? If that wasn't true, then, you know, he'd use the toilet and pay half the rent, you know? <laughs> but God puts us above the creation, right? We see that. This is why we have, you know, people for the ethical treatment of animals and not the other way around, right? There is no animals for the ethical treatment of people. Farm animals don't come together and try to figure out how to solve malaria, right? Because people are really hurting and suffering. God has placed us over creation, which means that we neither worship the creation nor do we destroy it. Rather, we see it as a gift from God. That it is a gift that has been given to us by God to care for and to utilize for the good of all humanity. This is God bestowing honor upon us. 
So, so now God has b- b- honored us and, and God has created us and he, he's given us his image and he's given us authority and rulership over the rest of his creation. And he continues in verse 28 and it says, and then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and su- subdue it. It says God blessed them. Isn't that good? Man, don't you love that about God? First he makes us, then he gives us his image and then he blesses us. God is such a good God. He is a God who blesses. You and I, we are blessed. That doesn't mean that life isn't hard, but just imagine for a minute how hard it might be if we weren't blessed. The Bible says in James 1.17 that every good and perfect gift comes from God. God is a good God who blesses us. And the more that I know about God, the more I'm convinced that everything that is good comes from him. God is a blessing God, and he has been blessing us from the very beginning. And God says, so God blesses, and then he says, be fruitful and multiply, right? Have some kids. We like that at our church, right? We're good at that. We just keep coming, right? He says, have some kids. Be fruitful. Now, this isn't all God's saying here, so don't, don't think for a minute. Some of you guys are like, well, man, shoot, I just, you know. Okay, God, I'm single, I'll do it, you know. It's not what he's saying. Listen, let me just say this really quickly, though. Children are a blessing from God and not a burden or a problem. Every child is a blessing from God. Every time you see a pregnant lady, that's a blessing. Every time you see the little kids running around our church, we're blessed. Now in saying that, God's not saying that the whole purpose of mankind is to have kids, okay? He says, be fruitful and multiply. He says, to fill the earth and subdue it. This is ultimately, what God's ultimately talking about here is being a people who shape the culture. This is what God's talking about. What what he's saying here is that we are meant to be a people who are reflecting him to every part of culture. That's why we have so many gifts and talents, right? It's why some of us are so adventurous. It's why we want to explore and we want to send people to the moon. We want to use our capacity, all of it, all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our abilities. We want to learn and explore and subdue because God put that here. We were made for that, and out of that comes culture. God made us to make the culture. You wanted some purpose and meaning this morning. How about it? That's kind of a big deal. Clothing, food, music, art, entertainment, education, family, politics, all of this comes out of the cultural mandate we get from God. Culture is the big junk drawer of life, right? It's all the stuff that we do. It's how we think, what we do. It's who we are. Culture is what we live It's what we eat, it's what we drink, it's what we watch, it's what we listen to, it's where we work, it's how we educate ourselves, it's who we love, how we marry, how we raise our kids, how we entertain ourselves, how we spend our time and our energy and our money and our efforts. And God's intention was that we would make culture that would glorify him, that we would affect every sphere of the culture reflecting the glory of God. Too many of us spend far too much time majoring in the minors. We get all crazy with this question, what am I supposed to do? We get crazy about that. Like there's just one possibility. And sometimes what happens is in the end you don't do anything because you're so scared to death of making the wrong choice. Listen, it's so much simpler than that. It's so much simpler than should I get a degree or should I go to work? Should, should I take, be a doctor or a teacher or a bus driver? Should I work at the mall? Should I take this position or should I turn it down and look for something else? It's simpler than that. It's all of it. It's everything. It's 1 Corinthians 10.31 that says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, just do it all to the glory of God. It's not this thing versus that one. It's your whole life. Whatever you're doing to the glory of God. It's not so much about the what you're doing, it's about how you're doing it, how you are reflecting the glory of God. This is good because your whole life matters then. Every person in this room matters. Some of you think that you're here and you're just going to church. Some of you think that you're just going 
home. You're just going to a job, but you're not. You're building a world. You're creating culture. A world that future generations will live in, for better or for worse. This means that everything that you do is important, right? That, that, that everything, in a certain sense, is kind of sacred because this is, in this culture-making project, whether you're a programmer or an artist, whether you're a dishwasher or a cook, you're a guy who puts on a tool belt and carries a lunchbox, right? Or you're a stay-at-home mom. Everything you do is important and it matters. The Bible says that in Acts 17 that God determines the times and the places in which we live that, in other words, God has put us here in this time, in this place, for his purpose. Are, are we getting the, the significance of how big this is? Are, are, we, are we starting to see a little bit of, like, how important our life is to God? You are an image bearer of God. And the key word here is image, okay? That, how, how many of you guys have ever known someone who's really concerned about their image? Yeah. You know what those people tend to do is they look in the mirror a lot, right? When you're concerned about your appearance, about how you look, you spend a lot of time checking yourself in a mirror. Sometimes you see ladies, not too funny, but some of those ladies, they walk around and regularly you see like this, right? I remember driving in the car and a lady was literally driving and her thing, visor was down and she was checking herself in the mirror and she was driving. That's crazy, right? Like, thank God no one died that day, right? At least not then. Right? But, but when you're concerned about your image, you, that you, you want to know what that looks like, right? You need to know that. God, God says that we, as his people, we bear his image. In other words, that we are like mirrors. We are reflections of God. And a mirror only really has one distinct purpose, and that is to accurately reflect the object of which it is placed directly in front of. That's its purpose. As image bearers of God, then, this means that people get a glimpse of God and of who he is, of what he's like, of what he's doing through the people that he has made. Now, we have a little bit of a problem with that, don't we? We have an issue that keeps us from being all that we were created to be and from doing all that we have been created to do. We have an issue that keeps us from experiencing the depth of our value and worth and significance from fulfilling our purpose, and that issue is sin. Because of sin, this image of God that we bear is stained. It's marred in some ways. Sin, sin corrupts that image. It separates us from God, disconnects us from our identity and our purpose. It doesn't stop us from creating the culture because it's what we were made to do. It just moves us to creating culture in the wrong ways. So rather than creating a culture of life, we create a culture of death. We start creating cultures that don't glorify God. We start creating cultures that glorify us. And because of sin then, there isn't respect for life, and there isn't respect for marriage or for children. There isn't respect for sex or gender. There isn't an ideal of honest work or of commitment or honor or truth. Instead, our worship gets directed away from God to all kinds of other things. And the world then is not ultimately put together the way that it should be. And neither then are we. This is why this creation story is so important. Us. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, which is really the end of this creation story here, it says that, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Why is this so good and so important? Because of this truth. Listen to this. God always finishes his work. That's really good news, right? It says that God finishes his work of creation so he can rest, right? So here's why this matters for us. Because if God has started a work in your life, then you can bet that he's going to finish it. The Apostle Paul says that in Philippians 1.6 when he says, like, being confident of this, he who began a good work in you will carry it out unto completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God finishes everything that he starts. 
You can know that God will work on you until you are a finished work. And yeah, we might sin, and we might fall, and we might make mistakes, and we might err, but God is a good God, and God finishes the work. God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God doesn't abandon his work in your life. And, and, and yeah, you know, we sin, and we should be aware of the, that fact, right? But, but we shouldn't spend all our time dwelling on that reality. We need to go back to the beginning. Remember what I said in the beginning? The beginning matters. Here's what's at the beginning. You were made by God. And you are an image bearer of God. So here's God then, this great and glorious God who does this amazing thing for us. He sends Jesus. Because it is in Jesus and his work on the cross that God removes our sin from us so we can get back to this image and likeness that we were made in. So we can live out of our true identity and purpose. God has this, this amazing plan and he sends Jesus on this recovery mission. So what the Bible says is that he sends Jesus for us according to 1 Corinthians 15 as a second Adam. That's what the Bible calls him. So that what the first Adam lost for us in Genesis 3 because of sin, the second Adam would regain for us by paying for that sin. The, the intentions for Adam that were lost through sin are redeemed through Jesus. And so Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, comes into human history. And here's what happens. He lives the perfect life. He lives a life without sin, and he willingly gives up himself, substituting himself on the cross to bless us and to pay the penalty for our sin, right? And then he says this amazing thing at the end when he gives himself up. What does he say? He says, it is finished. In creation, it says, God finished his work, right? And then Jesus gives up his life, and he says, it's finished. Jesus finishes his work. So God finishes creation, we sin, and then Jesus comes and finishes the work of redemption for us. This, this is why 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Right? That the old is gone and the new has come. That, that God had given us this image, this image bearer, this purpose, this mission. Sin took it away. And God said, no, 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 you're going to get that back. I'm going to send Jesus and he's going to redeem all of that for us. Man, that's a big deal. The, the result then is 2 Corinthians 3.18 that says, As all of us reflect the Lord's glory with faces that are not covered with veils, we are being changed into his, that's Jesus, image, into his image with ever-increasing glory. This means that in Christ we are changing from being like Adam to being like Jesus. God is stripping away our old self. He's removing the stains. He's removing the streaks that have kept us from this image and likeness to once again be what he has created us to be. And that image of God in us becomes more and more clear as we become more and more like Jesus. See that longing that you have in your heart to know who you are. To know that you matter. To know that you're significant and valuable. That you have purpose. It's found in just one place. Jesus. That's it. Remember that the beginning matters. Your beginning matters. It matters because of who you are and who you'll become. It matters because of where you'll go and what you'll do. And from the very beginning, it has been God's intention for you to know who you are, and to know that who you truly are can only be found in him. I'm going to have Noel come back up as I close this this morning. And I want to just close this morning by looking at just that last verse in Genesis chapter 1, because this is a summary of all of God's creation. Genesis chapter 1 Verse 31 says this, it says that God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. God saw all that he had made and said it was very good. The final word from God is everything is very good. Here's what I want you to do this morning. I want you to take a deep breath 
And I want you to know that God is a good God. I want you to take a deep breath and know that God is alive and he is well. I want you to know that God made you and that your life has dignity and meaning and value and purpose. And I want you to know that you are here on divine mission by a good God and that you may not consider yourself significant or important, but God most certainly does. So important and so significant, in fact, that he gave you his own image and he entrusted you with his creation. And even when you sinned, he gave you his son, Jesus, to redeem you. God loves you, and he blesses you, and he is at work even now in your life, and God always finishes his work. So we're going to just close this morning singing and celebrating because we as people have reason to rejoice. We have a reason to rejoice. We are blessed. We are image bearers of God himself. God has bestowed upon us glory and honor. And it's very good. And what I want us to do then after we leave here is we should go home, right? And we should be with our families. We should have lunch. We should get up tomorrow and go to our jobs and do all the things that God has given us to do. And we should be culture makers who are shaping this culture to the glory of God. You are an image bearer of God. God reflecting his glory through you. You guys stand with me. I'm going to pray, and we're just going to sing and celebrate this morning. Father, we just stand before you. God, humbled by your goodness. God, humbled by the fact that you created us, that you gave us life, that you knit us together. God, that you put in us and on us your image. Father, that you have given us dignity and value. Jesus' name, amen.